Welcome to Radio Free Sunroot. You're listening to the interview podcast, Voices for Nature and Peace, where we discuss issues of ecology, empire, justice, and consciousness. We feature a variety of guests who are aware of the challenges of our time and who are working to address them. Here's your host, Calibri Ter Sonnenblum. We're all preppers now. Featuring Margaret Kiljoy. Margaret Kiljoy is a trans feminine author and editor currently living in a self built cabin in the Appalachian Mountains. She is the author of the Danielle Kane series of novellas published by Tor.com. She hosts the podcast Live Like the World is Dying, in which she interviews people who think about how to prepare for and survive crises. Politically, she is an anarchist. She believes that society would be better off without systems of hierarchy and oppression, such as the state capitalism, white supremacy, patriarchy, and the like. Margaret and I have known each other since the early 2000s in Portland, Oregon, where we were both involved in the indie media and forest defense scenes. We lived in the same activist house for a while, and I always appreciated her analysis, creativity, and hard work. We hadn't talked for over a decade at the time of this interview, but we quickly fell right back into an easy, enjoyable dialogue. There's more laughter than usual in this episode, as both of us are able to approach serious topics with levity. Our conversation was centered around an essay she wrote in early January called We're All Preppers Now. We discussed elite panic, the three essential components of successful prepping, skills, gear, and relationships, the different scales of preparation, including individual, community, and grid level, the difficulties of agriculture in general and in the crisis, the challenges of off-grid living, including as learned from our own personal experiences, frontiersmen mythology, the importance of being in relation to the land where you live, how the most effective response to exploitation is not abstinence, anarchism as a form of effective social organization, anarchists in history, the role of imagination in making positive change, electoral politics and activism, the possibility of famine, and finally, climate change. We end the episode with a recording of the song Cast Fire from her band al which has also been playing in the background of this introduction. If you like this episode, please share it on social media. To support the podcast financially, you can make a one-time donation to username Colibri at paypal.me or at Venmo. You can also become a member at patreon.com, where you'll get early access to podcast episodes and also some exclusive content. Now here is my conversation with Margaret Kiljoy. Well, we could just kind of plunge in, I guess. So, okay, cool. Well, Margaret, thanks so much for coming on my podcast. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. And I wanted to start off talking about this great essay that you wrote earlier this year, uh, January 11th. Uh, it's called We're All Preppers Now. And I found it a really fascinating read because you're talking about prepping for possible disasters. It certainly feels like there's, you know, disasters that are on the, on the horizon. Uh, or as your podcast tagline is, your podcast for what feels like the end times. Yeah, it sure does. <laughs> you know, and I was really fascinated by the essay because I myself have been living in rural areas for the last 10 years and have been doing a lot of what would be considered prepping activities myself. And so you really put together some great advice here and then also kind of made some things clear that were on the borders of my mind, which I hadn't really synthesized as well as you could. So I wanted to just kind of call some of those out and, and discuss some of that. And I thought I'd start by reading uh, just a short excerpt from near the beginning of the essay um, where you go after one of the myths about disaster. So you write, 
Popular media about disaster shows us that crisis drives us apart, that without the rule of law, we all immediately turn on one another, trying desperately to get to the top. Yet actual studies of disaster show exactly the opposite. During Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, a large number of the looters were able-bodied, risk-tolerant young people gathering resources for those who were trapped at home by the floodwaters. It's precisely the reassertion of authority, usually from the government, but sometimes from new alternative power structures, that tends to disrupt this process of mutual aid. The main exception to this is, of course, rich people. People who are used to being in control are the ones who freak out the moment anything goes wrong. There's even a word for this, elite panic. Insisting on the norms of the now failing status quo is exactly the wrong move. Really well, well said. Thanks. I stole all of that from other people. But... <laughs> <laughs> well, all, all art is um, just theft plus spin, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I synthesized that from people, but I... Yeah, that's that's been something that has been on my mind about about disaster for a really long time. I mean, ever since watching the mutual aid projects in in New Orleans, which I, I wasn't part of, I just was watching my friends get involved with that mutual aid organizing, and I was just like, I don't know, just like watching watching the way that media would talk about looters and this and that, and it was just like that's not what's happening, and we can see that that's not what's happening, and I would get really angry because. Whenever you watch like a disaster movie, looting is presented positively. You know, the plucky gang of survivors is like, we right. have to find all this food. Fortunately, we know where a warehouse is or whatever. But then as soon as it actually happens in real life, like people can't handle it, that people do that. And it just, it really annoys me. Um, <laughs> yeah. Right. And the fact that, that rich people, um, you know, are I, I think that the connection between rich people and say media is really is is what went unsaid mm -hmm. here but is an important part of it they want us to believe that uh we won't behave well in a crisis yeah i mean it's interesting because i i think a lot of it is unconscious on right. the part of people who make media mm -hmm. because we're so used to one of the problems i think with a lot of people who make media is that their their primary input as artists is other art rather than lived experience, at least right. here in like places that have been historically safer, especially since like white and middle middle and upper class people have often been the ones who are allowed to make media here. It's people who haven't had as much life experience with uh, disaster on a social level, right? Obviously, individual bad things happen to people regardless of privilege. But um, and so it's garbage in, garbage out. If all you ever do is you watch disaster movies where everyone tears each other apart, you're going to make a disaster movie where everyone tears each other apart. Whether you are trying to like do something sinister or not, as compared to anyone who's seen bad stuff happen, you know, you like you like learn that, yeah, we all take care of each other and um but yeah, the elite panic thing, I actually only learned more about elite panic a couple months ago. And it really was like a final piece in this for me because I knew about government reasserting itself as when things often go bad. Right. To the point where sometimes individual actors within government are like, wait, no, we don't want to do this. Like there's, you know, people tell me stories about during Hurricane Katrina, uh, National Guardsmen would basically like steal supplies and give them to the anarchists because they oh, were wow. like. If I take this where I'm supposed to go, it's going to sit in a warehouse for three weeks. You're going to give it to people right now. And so people do that. And and actually, one other anecdote about that that I loved was um, uh, other friends of mine doing hurricane relief in eastern North Carolina a couple years ago. And the the people – and you had to fly into the area because the roads were completely washed out. So the people – who did the mutual aid work were risk tolerant young anarchists and then the kind of people who own small planes, um, which tended to be like li like right wing libertarian types. Interesting. And so, but, but not like the like rich, not the elite, you know, but the, like the, the people who obviously have very different political opinions, but, but, uh, but if you're willing to fly your small plane into a storm in order to bring food to people, like, 
on some level, I don't care about your political opinions anymore. You know, like, right. And he, my friends talking about being in a, a plane with this guy who probably they wouldn't have talked if they passed on the street, you know, flying into a storm together, like was just a, a really powerful image. And yet then I started learning about elite panic I actually personally first heard of it through the word Elite Panic, through uh, Robert Evans' podcast, Behind uh, the Bastards. That's where I heard about it, um, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it just made so much sense. It was just such a logical – and then since then, I've talked to some people who do disaster studies, and they've been like, yes, no, a, a Elite Panic is absolutely a thing. The rich are the ones who freak out. And it makes sense because they're the ones with something to lose. I mean – I mean, I have something to lose. I don't want to lose my house. I don't want to lose my life. I don't want to lose my stuff, right? I'm, I'm, I, I rely on my stuff. But I don't have like a larger infrastructure that supports me the way that the rich people do. And when it crumbles, they get real scared. But that part's cool. I'm not trying to be like, <laughs> but yeah, that's a healthy fear. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> they should be afraid more often. <laughs> I like that sort of it to the same place. Uh. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I wonder too, if part of it with, uh, with rich people also is that, um, that, you know, part of it, well, part of it is just simply that if you've ever been money poor, even if it's just for a short but intense amount of, of time in your life, hanging out with other money poor people, you know that there's a generosity among money poor people. There just is, you know, like, I definitely have have found this to be the case so many times, you know, in my life is that people with few resources who are kind of struggling are often willing to share with each other. And mm -hmm. certainly not, uh, you know, not in every case, obviously, obviously, there's always exceptions, but by and large, it, it feels to me like there's more generosity uh, among poor people than from elite or rich people. And so that's yeah. part of it too is that they just don't they haven't really been expressing it or doing it you know like they don't <laughs> that that's yeah. part of that's part of their different outlook on 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 human nature as well you know yeah because they haven't had to rely on i mean they do rely on other people they rely right. on the people that they exploit but they haven't had to like rely on actual equal connections with other people you yeah. know the way that yeah like when you don't have a safety net when you don't have a financial safety net or a familial safety net, well, I mean, sometimes family is part of the social safety net, but you you rely, yeah, and we rely instead on each other. That's true, right? And then also, I would I would expect that you know subconsciously, uh, many wealthy people are perhaps aware that what they're doing or how they got there and how they stay there is in part by. Um, stepping on other people or keeping other people down. And so they're sort of viewing mm. the world through that lens of, well, this is just what you do, even if they're not really thinking of themselves as the being that sort of person, you know? Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. Yeah. When you're used to, when you're used to hierarchy and it's totally justified to you, right. Then why would you share? There's no, ob you know, when there's no obligation to share, yeah, then you certainly wouldn't. I mean, most people would anyway. People share all the time without obligation to share. Right. But right. Yeah. Right. So so anyway, the the, the like sort of I mean obviously the the center or the theme of this piece is is like preparation and uh, you start off with with sort of the logistics of it and you talk about how preparation is built on three sides: gear, skills, and relationships. I really liked how you put that together into those three things because. I'd already been doing that or thinking about it, but hadn't just been like, oh, it's these three things. They do make a triangle of strength. Wow. And so, yeah, if you want to talk about that, that'd be cool. Sure. I've kind of, um, I mean, okay, so I've, I've, um, I've, I've lost my mind a little bit in the last year. I've been um, pretty much completely alone in a triangle in the forest because I, I built a cabin for myself not very far out of town, uh, a year and a half ago, moved into it and, you know, just treated it like a bedroom, went into town all the time. That's and an then the pandemic. Yeah. And it's an A-frame. Mm -hmm. I've seen pictures. And, it's cool so, looking. And, and one of the reasons I built an A-frame is because triangles are so strong because I'm not a particularly skilled builder. This is the largest mm -hmm. structure I've ever built. And I wanted it to not fall down. 
I also want it to survive like trees falling and stuff because I'm in a forest and I'm also not a trained forester or anything. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to build a triangle. And then I've been, uh, I've had a lot of time to think in the past year. Um, <laughs> because I'm, yeah, anyway. And, and so I've been thinking about things in triangles and it's been a revelation. It's been a really useful way to break out of the way that society tends to talk about things is either as lines, like left to right, uh, politically, for example, or as squares. And, and both of those are very useful for like constructing certain ideological constructs. But I don't think that there is, and maybe it's just because I'm, I'm on this particular kick right now. I really like triangles because like, you can't have a dichotomy with a triangle. And I think that people could look at like, oh, well, gear is nothing. Skills are what matter, right? Is like something that people talk about because everyone forgets about relationships entirely in the prepper world because the prepper world is largely right wing. And so people talk about like gear versus skills as if it's this dichotomy or a, usually a, a, a single hierarchy where skills are more important. And And then I realized that when I think about things as triangles, I can't say this is the opposite of this because everything is both the opposite of and next to everything else in a triangle. And when you think about the three points, so like gear and skills overlap and skills and relationships overlap and relationships and gear, they all overlap. So I've been thinking about everything from that perspective more recently, whenever I have a uh, something I'm trying to map out ideologically or politically or philosophically. I've been trying to map it to a triangle and this isn't perfect. You know, some things do work better. Um, not as triangles, you know, um, circles are great too, but, but yeah. And so, so gear, skill and relationships have been, have been the, the three because, okay. So it's like, we, we want to reject dichotomies because we're like, well, you know, we don't want things to be so simple because we recognize everything is blurrier and messier. And yet humans put things into categories in order to understand them in order to build larger ideas. And so like a circle is more accurate to describe most more concepts, but you can't build anything out of circles in the same way. Like you can't stack circles on top of each other and build a house. I mean, I guess it depends on the shape of them, but like you couldn't stack spheres very well. And Triangles, however, you can build shit with triangles because you have a, a clear delineation of of these points. And so gear, skills, and relationships, they all blur into each other. And there's other things that don't map onto this. But it's important in order to start doing anything to be able to map out ideas into very specific categories. And so I can say to myself, okay, what can I do right now? You know, if I have some money or have other resources, I can acquire gear or physical resources. Um, or if I'm totally incapable of doing that, maybe I can focus on relationships and then I can see where these things interact with other things. Um, yeah, I know that's sort of long winded and esoteric, but that's no, like, well, like, is. well, like, uh, if we bring in an example, it sort of brings it to life. Like water was one thing you talked about, I think, wasn't it? Maybe it was another part of the essay, yeah. but you could talk about it here. So like water in terms of gear would be, oh, I need a water filter, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, or, you know, like, like where I am, I have a couple different water filters I have in my camping stack, you know, and then, uh, I've also got, you know, a couple five or six gallon jugs that are just always full, you know, in case something happens to the pump here or something, you know, so that would, that would be the gear aspect. Right. And then what would the, so when it comes to water, what would the skills aspect aspect be about, about knowing how to purify it or to move it or. Yeah, exactly. Like knowing how to. Yeah, no. Okay, so like, let's say you have water filters, that's great. But if you don't know how to use them, does it do you any good? However, if you know how to use them, and you don't have them, does it do you any good? And so with water, you can say, yeah, like your gear is your water filters, your skill is how to use water filters, or how to collect rainwater or how to, uh, right. mm -hmm. um, how to siphon water out of a creek up a hill. Um, you know, how to do things with water that you would need to know how to do with water and then relationships would be i mean in some ways it would be like well i mean literally right now where i live my water comes from relationship my water comes from a relationship with my neighbor and you know my neighbor lets us fill up water right and um 
But then to take the same, to build to the next triangle, because it's all interlocking triangles in my, my system, uh-huh. uh, you also have scale. And so to take water, okay, so the, the, the three sides of the, the three corners of the scale is... I don't remember exactly. What oh, I word. can I can, I can tell you I've got them written down. You oh, had okay. it, yeah. You had it. The the three points were, um, uh, emergency, which is individual and short term, off mm-hmm. grid, which is community and medium term, and grid reclamation, which is a federation of multiple communities long term. That's what you meant, right? The scale part. Yeah, totally. Mm-hmm. Um, because so to take water again. Having some water on hand, is it like five gallon jugs or water filters, is incredibly important for minor interruptions in your water service. Whereas being able to um, replenish your water, like knowing where the creek is, knowing where the spring is, knowing how to collect rainwater on the houses, knowing how to dig a well, all of these things, that's like your kind of your medium scale and your medium term, what you would need. To, to last a couple years, you know, in, in different situations. Um, but then I would argue that we're, uh, this is the scale that often I think gets forgotten about in prepping circles, is that our long life expectancy and full lives do on some level require society. I don't believe that the society that exists does a particularly good job of helping us live our best lives. And I would love to see it look entirely different. But being part of a larger society is part of what keeps me safe, right? Because like like medical skills, I know enough first aid to get myself through most of the medical crises that I would run across in my current life. And I probably have enough people in my immediate community to take care of something slightly larger. Like I have herbalists that I could go to. I even fortunately know, you know, Western medical doctors who could do some kind of emergency surgery or that kind of thing if I needed. But if I had some like, major complex issue, I might need a a larger society that has allowed for deeper specialization in order to address that problem. So with water, you also, so grid reclamation, yeah, is is part of this is that um, not only do I want water personally, so that's why I have like, you know, 50 gallon barrels and water filters and uh, a way to emergency get water from the creek, although I haven't had to do that yet. Um, and then medium term, I theoretically know how to dig a well. I don't, I've never dug a well, you know, but I, I have ideas about how I would provide water for a larger thing. But then grid reclamation, I'm like, okay, well, what would I do if water was just totally interrupted and I wanted to be part of a society that provides people with water so I can do other things with my life other than focus on getting water? Right. Water is a sort of not always the best example in this case, but you know, right. No, I really, that was pretty fascinating to read that part because you're right. The, the, the largest and long-term level there of grid reclamation. I haven't really heard anyone talk about that before. I've heard about a lot about individual prepping, some about community prepping, but I haven't heard about that, you know, period. It's funny. It did remind me. I'd seen that in a movie once though, which was, do you remember the, the Planet of the Apes movies that came out a few years back, right? You know, where mm-hmm. we got to see where we got to see the, the, the monkeys on horseback with, with like rifles. Remember those series? It yeah. was great. Uh, so in the second yeah. movie <laughs> in the second movie, the survivors of the plague who were living in San Francisco wanted to go out and get the dam, the hydroelectric at the dam going again. Oh yeah, uh huh. Right? Totally. Right. Yeah. So that's 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 what you're talking about, about grid reclamation. Yeah. That's that that level of it yeah. there. Yeah. I thought you were going to talk about the postman. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember what part you mean by the postman. Well, the, in the postman, he decides to recreate the U.S. Postal Service. Oh, okay. I haven't, I haven't seen that. Uh, yeah. yeah. No, anyway. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I first got turned on to this idea because, I mean, I was running into this thing where a lot of people I know are just like, yeah, when – some people I know are like, yeah, the apocalypse, bring it. But then a lot of people I know, especially people who have like uh, different disabilities, whether it's like mental or physical health problems or for whatever reason, a lot of different reasons. People are like, yeah, when they – People who need insulin. Yeah. And people are like, I'm just going to die. They're right. like, I don't have another plan. My plan is to die. And, and I think about that and I want to – resist that but i don't want to be like oh it's fine you could do without your meds or 
we'll figure out how to, you know, on a small scale, extract insulin from what is it? I'm thinking of thyroid. I get all the, I don't remember how to, yeah, I don't remember those. how the insulin works either. No. Yeah. And, but then I, um, and I, I remember I was talking to a friend of mine who I'm hoping to have on the podcast at some point, who's a, a land use environmental engineer. And she's always very critical of a lot of, uh, a lot of my conceptions about how to rebuild society. And I really appreciate it. And she's always pointing out that she's like in her research about the embedded greenhouse gases in food. Like that is what she specifically studies is what has the least amount of impact on, on global warming in terms of food structures. Oh, interesting. And, and her position, which really challenged me, her position has been that the most effect, efficient way to feed people with the minimum amount of impact is not all vegan. It's not all local. It is the centralized production of grain and the decentralized production of uh, produce and then the occasional consumption of animal products that's also localized. Um, and, you know, and I, I, she once ran the numbers for me when I was like, oh, I'm going to write this book where it's going to be like plucky survivors in New York City and they have vertical farms and rooftop gardens and, and all of those urban farming stuff, right? And she's like, I can run the caloric needs of a city and tell you the amount of land and water and weight that is embedded in that. And you can't, there's a lot you can do with urban farming. Um, but specifically just meeting the caloric needs of people is really hard. And then I think we ended up working it out. I don't remember exactly, but it was like, basically it was like, I think if you like leveled Staten Island and that was like where you grew <laughs> all the wheat and soy, like maybe you could get away with it. I don't remember exactly. Um, and, and so at one point I was, I think it was from her that someone that she pointed out that it was like, okay, when a disaster strikes, you need to figure out how to get the grain that is currently sitting in silos in the Midwest and get it out to the coasts or people will starve to death. And, and the thing that I've always been saying is that people are like, well, how will we, you know, in, in an anarchist society, for example, or in a collapse society, um, how would we, you know, do the following thing? How do we make thyroid pills that people need? How do we make insulin? How would we do these things? And, and my answer is usually like, well, how do we do it now? The people who know how to do it still exist. The physical infrastructure of how to do it still will likely exist. And the knowledge of how to make that infrastructure will also exist. And it's possible that the physical infrastructure, like um, it might need to be retooled. It's possible that like, you know, the, the existing society is not exactly perfect. Um, but if nothing else, there are people who know how to load trains full of grain and there are people who know how to drive the trains and there's people who know how to repair train tracks. And so most disasters and collapse are less about the actual destruction of infrastructure and more about the destruction of the organizational systems that power that infrastructure as far as I can tell. Right. And so that's why I'm, I'm really interested in getting more people thinking about larger systems is that, you know, it, it, it's one thing, and it's very important to get people into DIY. It's very important to get people into thinking, oh, you have a problem, you can just fix it. it, it DIY and direct action are so directly related. You have a problem, you can just fix it. You know, like when my sink breaks, I have to fix it because I'm the one who built it, um, and there's no one else around. Um, but we also sell ourselves short about DIY because it's like, well, workers have also taken over factories and produced things. And like decentralized infrastructure held back fascism for years in Spain. It eventually lost. But like workers taking over munitions factories were able to produce the means of war to, dis to fight fascism. You know, we can do anything. And the question is, what do we want to do? But I think one of the biggest hurdles is to get people to realize we can do anything. Be and, and that's not people's fault. That is the fault of like, you know, I was talking shit on like sinister motives or whatever but i do think that there's a deep cultural thing embedded into people to say you can't do anything you need the government which is not you somehow even though we're ostensibly a democracy the government is not us we need that organizational system we we can't do large-scale things and we we can 
yeah, sorry to rant about that. No, no, that's great. Oh. I, I, I'm glad you brought up the the case, you know, in the essay, and then again here about grain growing, uh, mm -hmm. because when I was living in Portland still and doing the urban farming, we realized mm -hmm. that at that point we're like, okay, you know, just calorically. Uh, fruits and vegetables are 10, 15, maybe 20% of a person's diet, you know? Mm -hmm. And then the rest of it is like grains, beans, you know, that kind of thing, right? You know, and mm -hmm. legumes, you know, because, you know, a large proportion of the world's population lives, literally lives on grain, you know, lives on rice and beans, you know, with, with some vegetables. I mean, you can do it. It's totally, it's doable, you know, to live like that, you know? And so, you know, how how could you do that here? We did experiments in Portland. We got... Mm -hmm. Uh, we had, oh, yeah, we had, we had, we had two acres that we mm -hmm. were leasing in Milwaukee. It's that suburb just south of Portland, mm -hmm. right? So it wasn't in the city anymore, but it was still in the built up metropolitan area. And then mm -hmm. we leased another two acres that was actually just in the country. It was like out towards Estacada, you know, somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, and we did this for like three years. And the goal was to see how much we could do, um, like basically at the hand scale of things, you know? And yeah. so, so, so one year, the, the first year that we had the piece in the country, the previous farmer had planted some wheat to overwinter, basically just as a cover crop, but it was there in the spring, you know, for us. And so we're like, oh, well, here there's, there's an acre of wheat. Like, mm -hmm. let's, what can we do? Can we, can we do this by hand, you know? And so mm -hmm. um, when the wheat was finally ready to harvest, which was like, I don't know, June, July or something like that, we started having work parties and started having people come out. And I kept really close track of how many people were there, how many hours each person spent doing what task. I put it into a spreadsheet, the whole thing. I was like, let me really see, you know, let me, let me see these numbers, you know, right? And, and, and you know, um, just people going out there and, you know, using um, scythes, you know what I mean? To, to like cut it down, you know, or, or, or just taking the spikelets off of the top you know, then we would mm -hmm. put them on tarps and we'd stomp on them. And then you'd use, you know, then you, you'd pour it from bucket to bucket in front of a fan or on a windy day to, to winnow it, you know, et cetera. We went through that whole, you know, thing. And then to get, I think it was that each, each pound of processed ready to eat wheat or ready to grind down wheat, you know, was like an hour and a half or something like that, you know, of labor went into mm -hmm. it all together you know now that yeah. was starting with a planted wheat field so that didn't count planting yeah. it which would have been you know more you know what i mean yeah you know etc but it was like okay so if you were to actually pay someone 15 dollars an hour to do this now a pound of wheat is costing whatever that is 21.50 yeah. just mm -hmm. for the labor i was like okay so there's a reason why they have big machines to do yeah. this stuff, you know, because that's the only way that it can be done so affordably. And that's the only way that you can do it in such large amounts. You know what I mean? Yeah. Now, there's an in-between stage of mm -hmm. small scale equipment, but it's mm -hmm. not sold in the United States anymore. And it hasn't been sold in the United States for years. Oh, but, interesting. Yeah, but it's still made in Europe. So okay. there was Italian companies that were like making uh, like basically push behind combines you know what I mean? It was like, uh, you know, I mean, much bigger than like a lawnmower or maybe the size of a riding lawnmower, maybe something like that, you know? Uh, and, and, you know, they were kind of expensive. It was like five or $6,000 for this thing, but it was intended to, to harvest, you know, one acres, two acres at a time kind of thing, you know? And, you know, we looked into it and would have, you know, would have cost, it would have been, it was expensive for the equipment and then to have it shipped. I mean, that was just ridiculous, of course, to have yeah, some, yeah. you know what I mean? Just, <laughs> <laughs> just, you know, it like doubled the price of it. I mean, whatever. It was like something yeah. insane like that. So it's interesting because at the individual level of just doing it by hand, it's really, it's not practical unless you have a community who is just going to do that, which in the old days you did, you know, go back to feudal times. Oh, it's, 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 you know, time to harvest the wheat. Okay. Uh, it's not like people are like, oh, I'll, I'll get to it or on my weekend. No, no. Everybody just went out and harvested the fucking wheat. Right. And then that would right. usually happen. Right. And that usually happened around that pagan holiday, uh, Lamas, Loaf Mass, oh. right. Around August 1st. Right. So that's what that was for. You'd eat uh, a loaf of bread made from the last of last of last year's grains as you were harvesting mm -hmm. the new ones. Right. So so that's one level. Then at another scale, you've got this small equipment, you know, that you can only get in Europe now. Then you've yeah. got the massive scale, which is really hard to upkeep, actually. And in a collapse scenario, I mean, 
it's 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 uh you know some of these combines are so big that they're too wide to fit on roads they have to mm-hmm. bring the pieces on the backs of semi trucks to the field and put the damn combine together in the field because you can't actually drive it anywhere i mean that's how huge <laughs> this shit is and at this point a lot of those a lot of that equipment uh is now computer driven right by gps mm-hmm. and stuff and uh farmers have been having to figure out how to hack into the software so that they can uh-huh. do their own uh-huh. repairs and do their own thing because there's of course this whole thing now with proprietary software etc which is mm-hmm. keeping the farmers from even being able to control their own machine and of course that's been a a, a theme of the last yeah. 100 years is 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 the continually reinventing things in such a way that they're less and less easy for us to fix as yeah. people with with cars being the primary example of that but you know the it's not hard to grow wheat it's not hard to grow quinoa it's not hard to grow beans it's not hard to grow lentils it's super easy to grow all of those things a lot of them you can grow without any irrigation you know you can grow them dry but then harvesting them that is it's it's an issue it's an issue yeah. for sure yeah yeah and only so much of that can be done in each particular area too, you know, like, um, you know, you can't, you're not going to be able to grow all of that outside of certain cities in the Southwest because it's going to just be too, too hot. You know what I mean? Like Mm -hmm. there there is something to what she's saying about, about growing a lot of that in the Midwest and then shipping it to the coasts, you know? Yeah. And it's like, and the current systems of it are are terrible. And as you're talking about, you know, the, the further alienation of us ourselves from our own labor and, and all of those things. And that's like, you know, when we talk about like grid reclamation, who knows what we want it to look like, right? But it it might involve shipping food around, you know, and it might not. It might involve large machines, but maybe those machines are like made locally, you know, where you're like, oh, yeah, of course you build this in the field because it's a one of a kind strange machine that someone built the, you know, the people who live in this village who maintain the machine machine or whatever, like are very proud of their work. And, you know, like some things maybe we want to mass produce and some things we don't. And I think that's just something that we need to like think about and, and honestly engage with without assumptions one way or the other about what is and isn't best. And I mean, obviously like the, the systems of mass production that we have are, um, ecocidal and incredibly, uh, uh, incredibly horrible to, to human workers as well, you know? Um, and so some of those things you know, whenever I'm like the workers can take over the factories, it's like, well, I don't want workers spewing coal dust into the air or whatever, whether or not they're the ones who own it, you know, but you know, and grid reclamation probably doesn't look like anything like coal power plants. And then even like, you know, it's eventually it's funny. Cause like the more you live rurally the more you are off grid or whatever the more you come to terms with the fact that solar is like not okay actually solar is a really good example of this yeah let's talk Um, about solar Mm -hmm. so so for example i mean obviously obviously i guess people don't really talk about it the the copper mining involved in making solar panels is is very destructive right and i think you're more in the part of the country where that happens right um and but let's let's take the let's let's forget for a moment the embedded horrors in the solar panels themselves the batteries are incredibly um it's an incredibly bad idea environmentally and you know when people are like oh get off grid get some batteries and i'm like those batteries are only good for a couple years and they're making nicer and nicer batteries although i don't know about the you know ecological impacts of lead acid batteries versus lithium batteries i'm sure it's not particularly pretty i'm sure neither one of those is pretty but they're making better batteries, but still, like my solar setup that I'm I'm literally using right now, the lights in my my house are, and my computer used to be plugged in, but I just unplugged it because my battery was getting low, my external battery was getting low, and so solar comes in, I I, I and I keep it in my house, right, and so then when the sun isn't gone, I'm not getting any solar anymore, and it's just not effective, it's not efficient, and if you even if you wanted to power a small village with solar like or if you wanted to power an area with with basically you want a grid you a grid is a brilliant way to handle electricity if we're going to have electricity we need a grid because a grid in this really weird way is from each according to ability to each according to need hmm. because 
a grid says, okay, the sun isn't shining over here, but you know what? The sun's still shining further down the field. Like literally I have the problem where like I'm in the mountains. So like by like 5 PM, like my spot doesn't get solar, but like my neighbor's spot still does, you know? Um, and being able to have power be used where it's being used, but generated where it can be generated is just more effective and you need far less storage. And storage is the most, uh, is the hardest part of, um, of electrical systems. There's like some interesting stuff that's being done. Like I, I like the whole, um, like people have asked me why I don't do this, where you, uh, you pump water up a hill when Mm -hmm. there's extra electricity. And then that's basically a, a, a passive battery because now all this water is up at the top of the hill. And then when the sun goes down, you, you open the gates and the water comes back down and you have water pressure and you can run another turbine. Um, and, but once again, the math of that does not work out in a de- good for decentralization. Like when I decentralize that, it would involve building a water silo at the top of the hill I live on. Like that would hold massive amounts of water and, it's just not, it's not worth it. Um, I don't know, grids. I mean, and you know, the question is the, obviously, and yet at the same time, by living off grid and living off of a battery, I'm substantially more aware of how much electricity I use. Mm-hmm. Like I, yeah. I look at machines that people use and I'm like, why would you plug something that uses 1600 watts into anything? You know, I, right. <laughs> my refrigerator takes 40 watts because it's designed for an RV. And I'm like, you know, and and so I do think it's important that we like figure out how to simplify, like we shouldn't just treat electricity like it's an infinite resource. Absolutely. Um, So I don't want to recreate a grid that makes people think that this is just an infinite resource, but I still want a grid. I still like electricity. Right. Well, I'm really glad you mentioned the battery part of solar (laughs) because I think that most people who don't really know anything about solar other than they think it sounds cool, don't give mm-hmm. any thought to the fact that the battery is totally required, that you mm-hmm. totally need that, you know? And until you go and actually try to live with solar, you don't realize, oh, yeah, it's not it's not about having a solar panel on your roof and then everything's sort of plugged into that panel. It's that mm-hmm. the panel is feeding a set of batteries and you're plugged into those batteries, you know? Like, mm-hmm. That's that's a part that I didn't really know about until I was getting out into rural areas where there was solar. And I realized that most people aren't looking into that. They're not realizing that, that you really no, you can't do solar without 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 batteries. And then the batteries are. Yeah, of course, like you said, they're they're nasty. You know what I mean? Like there's yeah. really there, there's some real nastiness with that. And, you know, when I lived in the, in the city, I never really cared about the whole like you know, remember when the whole change your light bulbs thing was so huge, whenever that was like 10 (laughs) or 12 years ago, right? And they wanted everybody to switch from the regular incandescent bulbs to those funny twisty ones, you know, you know, the ones that actually had mercury in them. And they said, if you break it on the carpet to actually rip out that piece of carpet and put it inside like five bags and take it to a house. Remember that? Like, yeah, uh I was like, that's ridiculous. That's just, you know, I mean, thank God LEDs came along, right? Because that actually is a low power solution. But like, yeah, I was living on a, a cabin, um, in Northern California for a bit. And there was a bank of four batteries. There was a solar mm-hmm. panel connected to them that basically didn't do anything. And then there was mm-hmm. a generator um, mm-hmm. that ran on gas. And you would run the generator to juice up the batteries like once a day for like 45 mm-hmm. minutes. That's what you'd do, yeah. you know? And then in a setting like that, there's actually a big difference between a 100-watt incandescent bulb and a 15-watt LED bulb. There is, Mm -hmm. there's a noticeable difference, you know? And having, you know, and and like, oh, I'm not using the internet, I'm turning the router off, you know? Because if I left the router on all night, oh gosh, now the battery is like almost dead when I wake up in the morning, I have to run it first. I mean, it's really, it's been really valuable to have all these experiences and see that like, wow, you know, really we need to be talking about efficiency first, you know? That's the very first thing to talk about is, is efficiency and then reducing our own needs of what we think is, is, is necessary, yeah. you know? Like, no, it's not actually necessary to have the rod around while I'm asleep, you know? Right. <laughs> it just isn't, you know what I mean? Right. You, know, you know, that's one thing. But then, you know, but then how often do I need to have it on? And so you start to look at your own habits and your own, mm-hmm. you know, desires and this and that, you know, and, and that's that's all that that's all really important. And I I've really personally appreciate and I'm sure you appreciate too having had those experiences over the last few years 
because mm-hmm. now as we're entering what is clearly you know the beginnings of a, of a of a collapse you know it's like okay we've already thought about some of these things we've already been getting used to doing with less like right. you know like that there's there's things it now needs to go a couple more levels before it hits my shock level or whatever, you know? Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's like, I mean, that whole of the, the, um, the short term preparedness is really, it's all about the, like the fluctuations don't affect me as much. Right. right. Like if all of the grocery stores didn't have any food for a week, it would not impact my life. Right. Um, Whereas a year ago, it would absolutely have impacted my life. And um, but if the grocery stores don't have food for a month, it will absolutely impact my life. And if I know they're not going to have food for a year, then I need to go beyond my like stockpile and actually start growing food. Right. Um, and which I should probably do this year anyway. But yeah, it's funny. You're talking about the the like router and stuff. I um I have a my my inverter sets off an alarm if my battery goes too low. Mm hmm. And so I knew my, my last battery was dying because every night at like three or four in the morning, it would wake me up and I'd like wake <laughs> up disoriented and like climb down out of the loft and unplug my refrigerator and then go back to bed. <laughs> um, yep. And then just like hope the food in the fridge doesn't go bad, you know? Uh-huh. <laughs> and like, <laughs> whereas now actually I have this battery that, uh, I got for pretty cheap by pretty cheap. I mean like $400, oh, but it's nice. a, mm-hmm. it's a, it's like a grid tie battery. It's an industrial battery mm-hmm. and it's, it weighs hundreds of pounds, even though it's a lithium battery. And I, I literally don't know the amp hours of it because it, um, it was sold to me for cheap because it, it was no longer, it's down to about 70% efficiency. Uh, okay. So mm-hmm. it no longer serves its purpose in terms of what it was being used for. But it is still like, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars worth of battery to me. Like if I had replaced right. it with new batteries, it would be two thousand dollars, two thousand dollars worth of battery or something. Right. So I love it, and that's why I'm like, I'm getting a bigger fridge. I might have a freezer soon, Ooh. you know, because mm-hmm. <laughs> then I can start cooking. Well, then this gets into all the same crap too, right? You're like, I. It would be more efficient for me if I could cook a bunch of food at once and freeze it, and then like eat soup over the week. Um, but I can't do it because I don't have a freezer and I don't know. I think that where I live, people come move out here and are like, oh, this is so idyllic, idyllic. This is wonderful. Who needs all that civilization crap anyway? You know, who needs a shower? Who needs a (laughs) good internet? Who needs regular electricity? Who needs hot water on tap to do your dishes? You know, and and then everyone leaves after right. a year or two because mm-hmm. it sucks. It's just actually a worse way to live um, in most regards. Um, and there's a reason that people, including people like in the romanticized mythical past, like if they had a way to do something that was like nicer and better, they would do it. Like it, when you're talking about like like farming and, and I'm like water wheels and like windmills, right. you know, were used not for the generation of electricity, but to, to simplify grinding grain, you know. Um, they use windmills yeah. to run factories too, to like run looms, cool. you know? Cool. I mean, it's pretty amazing. Yeah. They were really, the, the the levels of technology and sophistication really that they were getting to in the low countries in Europe there, you know, before mm-hmm. coal. And then they kind of stopped because then coal and these other things came along. And so the innovation kind of ended, but you know, because the, 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 the tops of the windmills would rotate depending on what direction the wind was coming from, you know? Mm-hmm. And there was like a smaller little like, I don't want to call it a wind sock, but it wasn't exactly that. That was like basically there to be like, oh, I'm catching the wind and now I'm, you know, it, it would it would make it move, you know? Like it was really, it was really ingenious, you know, stuff that they were doing, you know? And I mean, I think that there is the degree to which uh, we can step back, um, we can step sort of down and levels of, levels of technology and not actually give up any comfort and not really give up very much convenience. You know what I mean? And uh, it, it'll be a life that's like, you know, uses far less energy and has less hassles, has fewer hassles yeah. too, you know? Yeah. Because there's a lot of hassles involved with all of this stuff. <laughs> I mean. No, totally. <laughs> you know, really, there seriously is, you know? 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I want. Is I'm like, no, I want hot water. Yeah. In me a too. perfect world, my hot water would be generated through passive solar and you know um, the heat of compost, right? Right. Like in the in the medium term, I'm using a propane powered hot water heater. Right. Uh, on demand. Like, yeah, yeah, I love it. Oh, and on um, demand. Oh, nice. You're so lucky. Yeah. <laughs> no. The only problem is that they break constantly in the winter unless you're actually good at draining them. And like, oh. they act. Anyone who's listening, if you have an on demand propane heater, the drain plug is not enough. You actually have to put quick releases on your water inlet and outlet and unplug all of it, including the drain plug. Otherwise, you're just going to be like, under the barn where I live, there's a pile of I think four or five broken on-demand propane heaters from oh my the different gosh. people here who've broken them, um, and we keep them around in case like we need to use the parts to fix another one of them right. or whatever. Right. Um, but so, but yeah, no, because be, they freeze. Be, that's what you mean. What's that? They freeze. That's what you mean. Yeah, they, the water in them freezes, and they uh, uh, like the only and then the the on-demand propane heaters that are designed against that are pretty much require, require gridded power because what they do is they have a sensor that figures out when they're getting too cold and then electrically heats the pipes. Oh, okay. okay. Um, and so what I'm going to do when I build a nicer cabin, I live in like a 12 by 12 a frame and I want to live in a like maybe, um, I don't know, I could use uh, maybe 10 times the square footage I have now, you know, <laughs> <laughs> um, that's still be smaller than most houses. Um, I, uh, I'm going to put in an on-demand heater, but it's going to be an inside one that's rated for inside use. Uh, and then, okay. but you run into this problem. It's just like everything cascades. You just, I know this is sort of ranting about off grid life, but the things that I don't realize is how much like everything requires everything else and maintaining a house that doesn't get below freezing inside is like fairly important for a lot of different systems, including right. charging lithium batteries. You can't okay. charge a lithium battery below freezing. You can discharge it below freezing, but not that much below freezing. And so even if I ran a generator to charge my batteries, I, I couldn't safely. And I think I've destroyed my cell phone battery actually that way. Um, and I don't know, just all, everything relies on everything else. And that's the thing that I'm like, it doesn't make sense to do it all by myself. Like we, we didn't develop as animals to do everything by ourselves, right. you know? Right. Right. And that's, and that, see, I tied it all back around. To that you did. To, to, you're getting back to fuck the rugged frontiersmen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's not about conquering nature and it's not about doing everything by yourself, you know? Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, totally. And I really, I really appreciated the, um, the fuck the rugged frontiersmen section i really i really did you know um because yeah you, what you were talking about there was um that the rugged frontiersman still has an extractive approach to life and and to the planet you know in in their thinking and then in their practices so uh i mean you're kind of describing the settler colonial lifestyle mm -hmm. or approaches is, is what you were what you were doing but that's definitely totally romanticized and i do see that in prepper circles for sure and i see that to some degree uh in um some of the primitive skills you know circles you know mm -hmm. too not not in quite the, the same way but but to some degree you know and then you know there's the aspect to it you know that probably isn't really worth discussing the the, the macho end of it that's just kind of annoying <laughs> yeah <laughs> no <laughs> that's yeah. at best it's at best comical but at worst sort of toxic you know <laughs> like, yeah totally. yeah <laughs> <laughs> I've been joking that I want to make a, a, a fake TV show to run ads for it. Because originally, Live Like the World is Dying, my, my prepper podcast was going to be um, also a TV show, like a YouTube show. Oh, okay. And then I just realized, actually, speaking of can't do everything by myself, I technically have the skills to make video. Um, but I like, I don't want to do all of that by myself. Right. And during pandemic, I'm I'm essentially by myself and I can't take on projects that require in-person work from anyone more than me, which is why I haven't started building a larger house actually. And, um, but I wanted to run ads for a show that was going to be called, uh, you alone can survive in the woods with a hatchet that you use to kill, um, eating squirrels that you kill with the aforementioned hatchet. 
Um, <laughs> and it would be like 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 war music and like someone like running through the woods all burly and like bah, you know um, because like the two things that I run across in like prepper shit is either the bunker mentality which is like build a bunker and stockpile it with stuff right or it's the to go bag mentality where it's like you've got some MREs and you've got a flashlight, you've got the best flashlight and you've got the like fanciest lighter and blah, 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 blah. And you're going to go off into the woods and use your primitive skills and your hatchet. And, and, and there's just so few uh, versions of, of a collapse where I'm alone in the woods eating squirrels. Like right. <laughs> I, I can easily imagine a version of a collapse where I need to walk for a week, you know? Okay. And so wood stuff matters, right? But not like I now make my new home in the woods out of – and that's the, the rugged frontiersman is the like I'm going to clear cut this area to build my cabin and, and like – and actually I got this critique from uh, the Indigenous Anarchist Federation, the folks who came mm. on my show mm -hmm. uh, talking about um, indigenous relationships to prepping and that, that, the way that they would talk, talk shit on the rugged frontiersman really um, – really opened up something for me to like realize that it wasn't just, I'd already been critiquing the bunker mentality, but I realized it's the whole extractive way of interacting with the land. Um, and which is weird to me too, right? Because the longer I live rurally, I mean, it's like how I have such a hard time understanding why you would want to live on land and not be in relationship to the land. Right. You know, mm -hmm. I know what you mean. It, it just doesn't it doesn't make any sense why would you not want to just like sit outside and, and i mean i don't spend all of my time like stargazing or, or hanging out with the squirrels or whatever but like it just it doesn't it doesn't make sense to me i don't look at this forest and think like i'm going to enjoy the part of it where i destroy it in order to make my home here you know right i cut right. down some trees to my house and it's made of lumber but that's different you know well, there's really, I mean, what you're saying, I, I think, is that there's really something to be said for living in the place that you're living, you know, for, for what that place is, you know, and, you know, there are different parts of, you know, the United States, for example, that, that are, that have different qualities, obviously. And I, I think you're in Appalachia is where you are, yes. right? Okay. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, and so there's a lot of differences between there and where I am, which is southwestern you know, New mm -hmm. Mexico, you know, which has been undergoing a mega drought for the last few years. And there wasn't even a monsoon this year. And it was like, I mean, oh, no. you know, yeah, yeah. Huh? Like, like I, I, you know, I, I did my best to grow as much food as I could on the property this year. And, and being an, an experienced farmer, I still largely failed at it because mm -hmm. the, the, it was so fucking high and so mm -hmm. dry. And there's an irrigation system here, but irrigation actually just doesn't cut it if it's that hot and that dry. You actually mm -hmm. just need rain. Plants want rain, you know? They they need rain too, you know? Or yeah. they need it to not be 110 degrees, you know? <laughs> yeah. You know? I mean, I mean, all, all that's just to say is that is that, you know, each place is going to have its its own, you know, advantages and disadvantages obviously, but each place mm -hmm. is also some place to be in relationship with as much as you possibly can be, you know? Yeah. Yeah. For, you all for, have huge advantages with like passive passive heating and cooling and solar. Right. Right. Like right. a lot of the development of passive heating and cooling houses comes from the Southwest, you know? Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's like 300 some days of year that are sunny here, you know? Like it was overcast today for like the first couple hours of the day and it was like really unusual, you know, like it yeah. doesn't, you know, and the particular structure I'm in here that was built by the people who I had the property before is straw bale, you know, mm -hmm. with uh, south facing windows. Oh my God, it's wonderful. You know, like right. it really, uh, cause it, it gets, you know, it gets into the forties and fifties in the daytime here at this time of year, but it goes down into the twenties or even the teens and occasionally mm -hmm. the single digits, you know, mm -hmm. and, but because it's uh, straw bale with these huge south facing windows, um, uh, there's not much wood that I have to burn in the um, in the wood stove. You know, I mean, I go through like four or five logs in an evening. I mean, split pieces, you know, not whole logs. I mean, that's not that yeah. much, you know. Yeah. And like when I was living in Oregon, where it was also wet and you also have to heat against that in the wintertime. And I was living in like streamlined trailers or like a, a school bus one year. 
oh my mm. god you know we'd go through three or four quarts of wood in a winter time i mean it was just like obscene yeah. you know yeah because uh, they weren't well insulated and because there's something there's the wet when it's cold it's just yeah oh, no, i hate I, it <laughs> Yeah. I love Oregon, but I hate that winter. Yeah. <laughs> I hate that winter there. <laughs> that nine months long winter. Yeah. Uh-huh. Oh my God. Uh-huh. <laughs> oh, geez. Yeah. That's no fun at all. Now, now, there was something I really appreciated that you said when you were talking about fuck the rugged frontiersmen mm-hmm. and the problem of living an extractive life. You then said that uh, responding to extractive thinking with abstinence is not uh is not the best response or the smartest response Mm -hmm. and i hadn't really thought about that before uh and i i I was pretty fascinated by that well it's like it's like the whole thing where it's like yeah i cut down some trees to to build my house you know and 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 that's that's what animals do like animals interact with their environment um yeah i don't know it's yeah it's been something that's it's I've kind of framed it sort of uh, almost religiously at this point. Really, it's been an interesting year. Um, <laughs> the things that I actually publish are very, uh, I strip away the names of like the gods and goddesses that reflect these values. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> that allow me to think up these things in the first place, you know? Um, because, okay, I, I've been thinking a lot about what it means to have a home where a home, and I didn't realize this until this year and I've lived I mean I've lived in a I lived in a, a van for six years and I lived in a minivan before that and I've lived out of backpacks and um and before I moved into this house I, I lived in a barn and but it was living in this house during a pandemic by myself that I was like realizing that a home is a space that you get to decide what is inside and what isn't inside it's like a the difference between inside and outside is this incredibly important thing right. that I get to control. And now, and, and, and that has some danger because that's like the, the, the civilizing urge, the conquering urge. And, you know, when you have an entire city where, and actually cities are perfectly organic and not inherently harmful, I think. But like when you imagine a clean city, a perfect city, a non-organic city, you know, where you control what lives everywhere and what doesn't live everywhere, both people and, and non-human animals. Um, you know, it's this conquering nature approach um, as compared to my house. I think of it as like a a rock in a stream that the the chaos and rot of nature where I live. The problem we have is rot. I, I also think about things in terms of like the two forces of basically like. This this is the most esoteric I've ever been on, in public, and so this will be interesting. Um, <laughs> the like, the sun and the moon. The sun dries things, burns things, irradiates things, uh, and kills things, and is absolutely vital to life. Um, versus like moist and water and um, the forest is uh, humid and it it um, it rots things instead. Like things don't rot in the desert. They they. Um, they burn they will they parch um right and so if you leave wood out in the in the sun it, it gets destroyed by the sun and if you leave it away from the sun it gets destroyed by rot and and so a, a house is like deciding that neither of those forces get to control this environment i get to control this environment and so the the humidity the the the, the rot whatever of the the, the woods wraps around my house and I actually need to create a, a larger buffer because, like, the closer the rot comes into the house, the more I have to repaint the the foundation more often, and the more I have to like figure out what the hell is inside my walls at two in the morning while I'm reading vampire stories. It doesn't help. Um, <laughs> that was what happened last night. And because all the old vampire stories are all about people scratching at the windows, and then there's right. like something scratching at my ceiling, you know. <laughs> um, and it's like I know there's no one around within like shouting distance of where I live. Um, <laughs> and, and so I've been thinking a lot about the difference between being a rock in the stream that the, the water parts around versus a dam versus being like, I control this entire space. Um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> That's what's been on my mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> well, I mean, the 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 urge to control is just so built into our into our mm-hmm. society, and so we feel a resistance to that. But then, I think what you were saying is that it's not as though we can do nothing and survive. Right. I mean, we have to do something, you know. And and so another way that I've I've heard what you were talking about in a different context was in the context of um, uh, land restoration or conservation, right? So like there's the concept of like wilderness, right? So that's the concept like, like, like okay, we're going to take this thing. We, we've, we've come here and we've, we've been cutting down trees. We've been doing mines. We've been doing all this terrible, terrible shit. So like, gosh, the only way to protect this land is to say that's designated wilderness and you're not allowed to be there. You're not allowed to do anything. You can't touch anything, you know, et cetera, et cetera. That's kind of the abstinence that you were talking mm-hmm. about in response to the extraction, you know? Whereas in reality, in most of what is now the United States, uh, there was never a, a, um, land like that that didn't have people on it where they weren't allowed to do things. You know? Right. And in fact, the mix of plants and animals that were found in a particular area, you know, uh, were often the result of choices that have been made by the people who were here before the invasion, right? You know, and so so that that's what I thought of when I when I read that because I'm like, ah, that there it is. There's the analog where yeah. it's kind of because the the abstinence approaches is, you know, I mean that's kind of Calvinist or puritanical too, isn't it? I mean. Yeah. So, so in a way you haven't escaped at all. <laughs> yeah. Like when we say like, we're not animals, we're totally separate. Like even like the idea, like I think the cities are organic construction, you know, it's like, we're not outside of nature. So anything we right. do is nature. That doesn't mean I'm like, hooray, smokestacks, hooray, endless concrete or whatever, you know, I can still hate it. Um, I really like this analogy you're making. And it actually reminds me about like, um, the conception of anarchism that people have versus the sort of reality of anarchism. As oh, a cool. I wanted concept. to talk about this. <laughs> um, because, like, it's not like we're saying just get rid of all the bad organizations and let everything happen as it will. Because, like, most places, yeah, if you, if you declared a random suburban area a wilderness zone um, and did nothing to it, it wouldn't necessarily i mean it would become interesting i actually would be that would be very exciting for me i would love to see that Mm -hmm, but like but a a conscious recreation a a conscious like a stewardship or whatever and stewardship is a weird word but um is is much more interesting and anarchism i think is is that in terms of social organization it's not a lack of social organization but it's instead a lack it's a, a rejection of the existent social organization and the like the development of like a chaotic an organic social organization in the same way that you can't say the way to reclaim at wetlands is you do everything like this every single time you have to look at the space you're in and be like well the water's flowing down here and like we'll just kind of let that water do its thing but this thing we need to build up and i actually don't know anything about rebuilding wetlands and this will become very obvious um <laughs> and and so that's what i feel about anarchism and society is that we it's not about You know, I find that like if you suddenly take away all power, like um, you get a bunch of get a group of 20 people together and the people who like brought them all together leave. And now the 20 people don't like know what they're supposed to do or like who's in charge. Um, It doesn't have like inherently good results. Like for the most part, people kind of do nothing until someone proposes a structure. And if the structure looks like it might work, people will follow it. And what I've found in that kind of situation is to be the anarchist is to propose a structure, but that structure be an egalitarian structure that responds to chaos and responds to different inputs. And um, and so that's how I feel about like what my role as an anarchist in any collapse environment would be also is not I'm in charge now, but someone needs to stand up and say, we're in charge now, you know? Because if no one stands up and says, we're in charge now, first, nothing good will happen. And then someone will stand up and say, I don't like all this, nothing good. I'm in charge. Right. Strong man. Yeah. Yeah. Which, yeah, that, that can, which could often be a, a, a bad situation for everybody involved. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Now, I'm glad you brought up, I wanted, I wanted to bring up the topic of, of anarchism because, of course, when most people hear the word anarchy, 
you know, I mean, most people, mainstream people, et cetera, you know, they, they, just, they just think chaos, you know, mm -hmm. like they're not thinking about it as being um, a system of thought, you know, or, mm -hmm. you know, it, you know, or and they're certainly not thinking about it as a system of thought that has a history with a lot of different mm -hmm. experiments that have happened over time, many of which have been really interesting and successful. And that's yeah. one thing that I've appreciated uh, seeing you write about. Um, from time to time is all the research you've done into historical instances, you know, of, of anarchism being being tried in different situations. And, I, you know, a lot of these situations, of course, were um, times of crisis in some way mm -hmm. or another. So so in that way, there are examples to look at, um, you know, within the context that we are, we are here now, where we have all these unfolding crises, you know, that are happening. I mean, those were some of what those anarchists were doing that was successful maybe was the result of successful prepping at that time, even one could say, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no. That... <laughs> Just to kind of yeah, bring yeah. it all back. <laughs> no, no, that's like a really interesting perspective because in some ways, you know, there's a certain amount of like revolutionaries have always kind of been like, well, one of the things you do is your goal is not die until there's an opportunity and then like take the opportunity, uh -huh. right? Your goal is to like, I mean, you're attempting to like build and in most most different revolutionaries, including anarchist revolutionaries, you're, you're trying to build a movement, right? But it's not like you build and build and build until you suddenly have enough power to, to topple the existing system. The existing system almost always needs to stumble in order for there to be an opportunity to, uh, to replace it. And and, you know, and, and also sometimes I think that um, and this is a more interesting point that people probably disagree with me about. I think there's actually an ethical imperative to not always creating crisis um, because while the existent absolute, mm, you know, I could really argue against this my, myself, but like, I, I don't want to be pro disaster or pro collapse Right. Um, I am pro revolution. I am pro replacing the existing systems with better systems. Right. Uh, but accelerationism, the idea of like making things worse in order to give their, in order for there to be an opportunity to make things better, um, doesn't appeal to me strategically. And it also doesn't appeal to me ethically because I don't believe that it's okay to make things worse for somebody like as a specific plan. If that person is not oppressing you, you know? Um, right. But but yeah, no, I, I, I go back and forth about thinking about like uh, take the, the classic high water mark of the anarchist movements, the Spanish Civil War, when huge chunks of Catalonia became fell under anarchist worker control while the anarchists were busy fighting a, um, a fascist invasion, uh, a sort of it would have been a coup, except anarchists and Marxists uh, took up guns and shot fascists and George Orwell threw grenades at them. Um, and. And held them back. Uh, eventually, the fascists won, but for several years, huge chunks of Spain collectivized under anarchist principles, and it kind of happened all at once. But it also was the result of forty years of organizing and like multi generations of like cultural work. There was like anarchist fiction magazines that went out to subscribers of like fifty thousand. Um, that's you know my own personal like area of interest, so I can learn more about that, and. You know, it was um, anarchist ideas and anarchist schools and anarchist like concepts were were everywhere in Spain for a very long time. Mostly, it just meant that they got shot a lot by the government, but they managed to like hold on and continue to have this movement until, um, well, basically until the the sort of lots of upheaval and political changes happened kind of all at once. They didn't really have a collapse as far as I understand. Um, and I don't know, it, it's, it seems like an interesting, I like the idea of that actually ties into me. Cause you know, one of the things I talk about my prepping podcast, as much as I talk about like first aid and stuff, I also talk about like envisioning better societies and things like that, because I, I would argue that, um, revolution is is part of survival at this point because we are in a crisis like we're all gonna fucking die of global warming right um but like 
like literally even in, in our lifetimes, people are always like, oh, it's like the, the youngest people have to worry about it. And I'm like, no, I'm pretty sure that like we have to worry about it. Yeah. Um, and so if we don't want to die, we have to change the systems we live in dramatically. Um, so I believe we are in a survival situation right now. So I, I absolutely believe that revolutions and it's almost like goes with like the grid reclamation thing. It's like revolution is, is a necessary component of rational um, preparation, I think. Right. Right. Well, and, and something you didn't mention in the essay, but you'd kind of mentioned now is and that I've been thinking a lot about lately is that part of prepping is um, psychological, for want of a better word. Uh, but where one is opening one's own mind, you know, you're opening your own mind and trying to open up the minds of people around you to the idea that things can be different, you know, because mm -hmm. there's this there's kind of this hypnotic spell, you know, that that you get caught in, you know, that we all get caught in to some degree or another of like, oh, this is how things are, you know, and oh, we're driving cars and they do this and, and oh, we, you know, like, like, it, you know, Oh, it was just kind of inevitable that we'd be living like this and like there really isn't any alternative. And, you know, like that's just kind of where I don't think that that's necessarily where humans tend to go in general. I'm not going to say it's a human nature thing, but what I'm but but, but I'm definitely seeing that in our society. You know what I mean? That yeah. there's well, you could just call it a lack of imagination you know, yeah. really, you know, and, and so that's part of the prepping, too, maybe is imagination. Yeah. I, I agree. No notes. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> right. right. We, we just need to actually, um, yeah, realize that we could live differently. It's, it's, it's startling. I mean, I remember talking to someone I care a lot about, uh, who, who's a good liberal who was, I was like, look, we, we need to change at the very least our industrial and economic systems or we'll die. Right. Global warming's real. Right. She's like, yes. And I'm like, so at the very least, we need like a Green New Deal type thing, right? And she's like, yeah, but I don't think Nancy Pelosi will go for that. And I'm like, but the alternative is die. <laughs> right. So doesn't it seem like whether or not Nancy Pelosi thinks we should do this is irrelevant? Like, are there ways we can compel this to be possible? Because doing that seems like a uh, biological imperative at this point. <laughs> right, you know? right. Uh, and and I'm not trying to like shame this person, you know, who's incredibly caring and like I actually think would make a brilliant anarchist, not a good anarchist now in terms of changing a system, but living within a system based on mutual aid and solidarity would do totally well. But I think that people have a hard time understanding that we have agency. And so I, I, I do believe that, you know, I remember at one point realizing that part of the point of protest and militant direct action protest is not even always about winning specific goals. It's we should try. We should try to win specific goals. But learning that we can take power is more important than most of the immediate strategic and tactical goals that we could have. Um, because it's what teaches you that like, like if you ever have a cop run away from you, you will never forget it. Mm -hmm. You will never forget that the systems of control are, maybe they mostly make you run away, but you, you never forget that sometimes they run too, you know? Right. Right. Yeah. And in the case of the person you're describing, and I, you know, I know people like this, you know, too, I mean, that's where there's the you know, and no insult to that person, but, but that's where there is mm -hmm. that lack of imagination because so many people who are caught up in the partisan game, you know, they just, they really just can't see anything outside of that, you know, and it gets worse. Right. It gets worse around each election. And, you know, this last, you know, presidential term we just went through, it's kind of like people got obsessed with the presidential stuff and then they didn't drop it after the election and they stayed obsessed about it for four years you know, mm -hmm. like, I feel like I hadn't seen that before in my life. And I feel like it was really, it was damaging, you know, it was damaging in mm -hmm. its own right, that people remained obsessed with the top of the ticket, you know, and we're not looking mm -hmm. any further down. We're not looking at community solutions. We're not looking at individuals. We're looking at anything, you know, there was just such a, 
uh, there was just such this, oh, is if, you know, anything that happens is this dude's fault. You know, as soon as we get this dude out, everything will be fine. Like, like it wasn't even that bad during the Bush years, you know? Right. There was such an obsession. It, that's interesting to me because I probably was part of that obsession, but I, because I tend to think that the only thing worse than neoliberalism is fascism. Right, right. You know? And, um, I mean, agreed. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so there's this like, it becomes this like, I mean, I was so mad because I was like, we already have one existential threat of climate change right. barreling down on us. Right. But to have to stop and squash fascism again is right. like irritating, you know? And I I do think it was necessary, but whether that means specifically focusing on Trump or not. I mean, in some ways, though, I would argue that Trump is the right wing realizing that they can think outside the box Whereas the liberals, not the left, but the liberals didn't realize that, you know, uh, interesting. Like, because mm -hmm. like Trump was basically people being like, well, we have to have nationalism and deal with these crises. How can we do it? The existing infrastructure won't work. I know we'll vote for this, you know, like ideologue. Um, that's interesting though. I'm, and I do see what you mean, though, about the way that we, we tend to focus on – I've always hated election year as an anarchist, right? You know, because it's the year where all of a sudden all your, like, sort of comrades, like, stop caring about anything except the election. Yeah. You know? Um, but I I don't know. I think we've had more organizing under Trump on a community level than we did prior to that. You know? I Okay. Um, the question is whether it was all so obsessed with Trump that that will drop off com completely now, um, which it it will drop off a lot and already has. But I'm still like optimistic we'll come out stronger on a community level. I'm not sure. Right, right. Well, I mean, the Black Lives Matter stuff was not focused exclusively on Trump by any means. At least I didn't. I didn't think so. That was really pretty focused on the cops, you know. Yeah. Where, where, where it belonged. And so that was, that was definitely encouraging, you know, you know, and, yeah. and, and as for, you know, organizing, you know, under a Democrat, well, you know, the Clinton years gave us the anti-globalization movement, you know, and anti-WTO, right. you know, and under Obama, there was the, um, the Occupy thing that happened. Right. And then that's when Black Lives Matter started. So, I mean, I think that, you know, those things will happen, but yeah, it just, they're, they're, I don't know, like, we're obviously reaching some breaking points here where 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 the things that have been going on that have been business as usual um are just not going to be serving us you know anymore right. you know so yeah right. i mean yeah we we we're all preppers now <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's, it's it's like you said it yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you did. Yeah. You you talked about centralization versus decentralization in the essay too. That was also pretty interesting, you know? I mean, yeah, I I just there, there's there's so many there's so many ways in which we need to rethink, you know, a lot of the things that we've been doing because the circumstances are changing, you know, so much now, you know? And when we're talking about um a climate that's changing so rapidly that we're not going to be able to grow food in some areas where we once were able to grow it is obviously a big deal. And I think right. that, you know, you know, when, when, the, when the pandemic hit, you know, I was not really expecting a pandemic. I was expecting big things to start happening. But when the pandemic mm -hmm. did hit, I was like, oh, pandemic. OK, well, we've been through this one before we the human race. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, we've been through countless right. pandemics, you know, like. Right. You know, to some degree, we know the drill, you know, we already have this right. word quarantine, you know, that goes back to like it refers to 40 days of, you know, staying by yourself. I mean, you know, that there's, you know, like we already even before we you know knew about germ theory, we knew that you needed to like, you know, uh, you know, not have everybody mixing in one place, et cetera. I mean, right. you know, like. And so, you know, that, that happened, the pandemic happened. And the other thing that's been in the back of my mind for the last 10, 15 years that hasn't happened, but which is a very common thing throughout history is famine, of course. Yeah. That one's scary. Yeah, that's actually how I started prepping this time around was, 
Well, I actually, I didn't really do any real prepping because I, I lived out of a backpack or a van and not that you can't do any prepping with that, but obviously like you're not going to be stockpiling anything. Right. Um, it was actually, it was that land use scientist, a friend of mine, uh, maybe four years ago was just like, Hey, like it probably won't happen, but famine is a much higher percent of chance this year than most years. And I was like, got it. And I went out and bought a bunch of like five gallon buckets of beans and rice, Right. you know, mm-hmm. because I was like, okay, like probably this won't come up, you know, but the, the, if there's interruptions in the food supply, it's worth, it's worth knowing about. I, yeah. And I mean, it's interesting because like, mm, I actually don't know whether our society is more resilient to famine because of like the scale of our industrial infrastructure or whether it's um particularly vulnerable to it because it is um you know there's obviously a certain fragility in monocultures and things like that right um i have no idea i mean there's a tremendous you know the fact that that so much of our cropland in the midwest is being used to raise crops for fuel for biofuels or to make to raise crops for um for animal feed basically mm-hmm. means that we have some slack to play with. That's the good news, you know? Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, cause there's extra, right? Like, like there's, right. it's, it's, it's less than half of that, of that's actually being grown directly for human consumption. You know, the majority of it is for things that could be cut out or cut, you know, way back, you know? And so that's, right. that's, that's what we've got going for us. But, but still like, I mean, you know, the dust bowl i mean these things happen you know like yeah yeah. and it's 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 all happening faster than than we thought it would i mean you know when when you and i were living together in portland in like 2003 Mm -hmm. 2004 or whatever i mean we weren't really thinking or talking about climate change very much at that point no we were we were on the opposite page we were talking about um uh running out of oil yeah yeah, yeah, that was that was that was the big thing, you know, you know, and now you know, like you know, like the ten hottest years on record are like in the last fifteen years or whatever, right? I mean, right. we've hit this point where things are really accelerating, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Ugh, I worry about <laughs> you know you're talking about growing food out in the desert, and there's a have you read this zine called desert that came out a couple years ago, mm-hmm. maybe 10, 10 years ago? No. There was this piece written by, I believe probably UK anarchists who had previously written my, my favorite strategic piece in the mid in the early aughts, which was called down with empire up with spring. And it laid out ways of um, fighting against sort of um, an eco focused anarchist approach to fighting against uh, empire. And, and then maybe five or ten years later, they wrote a piece called Desert. And Desert is a piece about basically being like, we were wrong. We won't win. The only thing we can do is learn how to adapt to a changing ecosystem in order to like survive and possibly have a chance of propagating better ideas. And it was interesting because it's presented as eco-nihilism. Hmm. Uh, but I read it found it in almost like um, naively optimistic in the way that it describes like the changing ecosystems um, because I've been on a page for a while and I'm not trying to argue that this is what the page people should be on. Um, but I've been on a page for a while where I think that probably we're going to have to grow a lot of our food underground. Like I think that wow. we're probably going to have to live in like climate controlled environments, whether they're passive or active climate control. I don't know. Um, you know, in must in in much of the world, and I think that we're probably gonna have to like learn more closed loop systems by which to grow food, as if we're living on Mars or whatever. You know, um, and I don't know. I hope I'm wrong. But... Yeah, yeah, I do too. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, which is an, another point in like uh, one of my earlier essays, "Live Like the World Is Dying," comes from an essay called "Live Like the World Is Ending." Before I, someone pointed out that I could have gone for the cute pun. Um, in which I argue that the things to do when the world is ending is like one is prepare, but that's only a quarter of it. One is to think that maybe the four, the four things you got to do. One is realize that you might be wrong and everything might continue. So you shouldn't burn right. all your bridges. Right. Mm-hmm. Two, you should assume that you won't survive the end of the world and live like you're going to fucking die and go all YOLO and shit. Three, live like you might actually survive the end of the world and prepare. 
and four stop the end of the world like hmm. um so status quo revolution yolo and um preparation those are like my the the podcast is clearly focused on on preparation and revolution but um my own how i go through my life is is remembering all four of those points right yolo what's that uh you only live once sorry it's ah, the, okay okay that's a nice one yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah, I like that. Cool. Well, we talked for quite a bit. I feel like that's yeah. a, a that's a good that's a good end that's a good end spot. I'm glad that you kept bringing up your podcast because I, that's obviously some place that we want to send people. And it it just you just look it up under the name or or. Yeah, I mean, you know, wherever people listen to podcasts, they can find it. Um, but it's also live like the world is dying. Dot I think com. Um, but yeah, search for it and whatever podcast whatever you're listening to this on. Cool. Cool. And you do all sorts of cool music too. And I was, you know, hoping that you would introduce that. I'll, I'll, when I do the production of this, I'll, I'll throw in a song at the very end before the credits. Okay. So you can, you can send me that song, but right now what you can do is you can introduce whatever song that is. Mm, okay. Uh, this song is called cast fire by my band Ulcerath, which is, um, and this is the first track we've made with a closed border between us. Um, the, my bandmate Jack lives in, in Montreal, and the point of this band was uh, the, the very beginning was to sort of reclaim our interest in, in neo folk as a genre that unfortunately has a lot of like right wing ties. And so we were like, well, we want to make anti fascist neo folk because neo folk is kind of about reclaiming romantic and folk music, um, not in a singer songwriter folk like American tradition, but more in a in, well, in this case, a more European tradition. Mm. Um, but then this particular song it comes out of something a little bit different where the song was sort of, we eventually realized that we wanted all of our songs to be spells to try and get across specific emotional spaces and uh, propagate certain ideas. And this song, I'm particularly proud of it, so that's why I'm rambling about it, um, is uh, I wrote it on piano while I was in the midst of a pretty deep isolation, which I continue to be in. And then I recorded an instrument that I invented called a goblin bass over it, which is a, a four foot long bass zither with metal and nylon strings that I bow. And that's been one of my favorite things I've come up with during pandemic. But then Jack adds vocals, both, um, both harsh and pleasant vocals over it.
Piece by piece. Nice. Cool. Well, that, that's what we'll end with then. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Voices for Nature and Peace is produced in the Gila River Valley, New Mexico, USA, on land that we acknowledge is illegally occupied Apache territory. The intro music is Zero G Yogi by Big Z, with narration by Kelly Moody of the Ground Shots podcast. This outro music is Trip A, also by Big Z. Commercial break narration by Nikki Hill. To become a financial supporter of this podcast and to gain access to members-only content, visit patreon.com slash colibri, K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. For more information on Radio Free Sunroot programming, please visit RadioFreeSunroot.com. Thank you for listening. May you find joy in your own nature and peace.